Hello everyone, welcome to St. Peter and St. Paul United Church of Christ. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. This is Trinity Sunday and we are glad that you have tuned in to worship with us today. Uh, we have Joel and Mary Beth and Aaron Westermeyer here and Garrett Woods, our music director. And uh, we appreciate all of their help in putting our uh, weekly worship video together. They spend a lot of time uh, preparing and, and uh, carrying this out, and we are grateful for their efforts. And we're grateful to you for tuning in and, and watching and worshiping with us today. Uh, today we uh, celebrate the Trinity, and uh, we pray that God will bless us and be with us as we worship together. So let us prepare our hearts and our spirits for the worship of God. Please join me for our responsive call to worship. Come into this household of the living God, the three in one. Gather in the wonder of the mystery in which God has invited us to share. We have come as the family of Christ, led by the Spirit of God. Ascribe to the divine glory and strength. Ascribe to God the glory that is due. Worship the triune God in the beauty of holiness. Our hope is that in this time of worship and learning, we might embrace what lies beyond our imagination and understanding. Our first hymn is hymn number four, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. Oh, my. 
Please join me as we pray our prayer of invocation. O God God of mystery, mystery, within your your very self, you model the beloved community. You are the wisdom within our hearts, the word who dwells among us, and the spirit who calls us beyond ourselves. Let us know your presence here today in a way so that we might celebrate your love and go forth rejoicing with prophet Isaiah, saying, Here am I, send me. As heirs of God, let us come to lay our sins and wrongdoings and lack of faith before God. Let us come with hearts that seek newness. Please join me in our prayer of confession. Holy One, we acknowledge that too often we try to live not acknowledging the mystery of your being. Even though you have shown us your truth, we allow ourselves to rest in our own uncertainties. We find ourselves unable or unwilling to embrace the love through which you sent Christ to live among us. We take for granted the grandeur of you as creator, of Christ as redeemer, and of the Holy Spirit as an ever-present sustainer. We do not let out the beloved community you desire for all. Forgive us, we pray, and help us to give testimony to your love. We trust in these promises that the triune God in each of the three persons promises us newness of life and the gift of new birth. The divine Trinity invites us to testify to the Trinity's being as the foundation for the reconciliation of all of God's people and for everything in creation. In these truths, we trust and give thanks. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. This weekend marks Memorial Day. Monday is Memorial Day, and we take this time each year to remember those who have given their lives, those who have lost their lives in the service of our great nation. Uh, Veterans Day is the day we honor our military veterans. Armed Forces Day is the day that we honor those who are currently serving in the Armed Forces. And Memorial Day is the day that we Uh, dedicate to remember those uh, who have given their all, who have given up their lives for the service of our our nation, our land. So let us on this Sunday thank God for uh, those uh, who have fallen, uh, those whose memories we will keep alive, and uh, those who have shown us what it means to live a life of service and a life of sacrifice. Uh, Jesus said there's no greater love than to lay, one's, lay, lay down one's life for one's friends. And indeed, they have laid down their lives for their friends, for you and for me, and for the freedoms that we enjoy. So at this time, I'd like to bow for a moment, uh, and may we share a few moments of silence and remember uh, our fallen veterans. Amen. And now we come to our time of pastoral prayer, and I invite you to think about all of your uh, joys and concerns that you bring to worship today, and we will lift those up to God. Uh, We pray for the personal needs that we bring today. We also pray for the needs of our nation uh, and for the needs of our world. We continue to pray for peace uh, in Israel and pray for the safety of both the Israelis and the Palestinian people. We pray that God will be uh, with those who live in the Holy Land today. Let us now turn to God in prayer. 
Almighty God, you are known as wisdom before the dawn of creation. Lord Jesus Christ, we know you as perfect love made flesh. And Holy Spirit of God, we know you as the one who is ever present with us. O hidden source of life wrapped up in perfect trinity, we meditate upon the great and gracious plan which you have brought to pass, that women and men like us should look beyond creation to worship you, the creator of all things. In the beginning, you, the uncreated, moved across the face of the deep and brought out space and time and material substance. You brought forth the atom and the molecule and the crystalline form. Then the first germ of life and the long upward striving of all things that swim and creep and fly, and then the miracle of intelligence and consciousness, the beginning of mystery and the building of the first altar, and then the saying of the first prayer. O hidden love of God, forgive us for those times when we have taken this mystery for granted, and forgive us all the more for the times when we have thought that we had unraveled the mystery and thought that we knew it all, and how, the where, and the why. Almighty God, be with us today. Be the mystery that we long for. Almighty God, let us not harbor anything in our hearts that might spoil our fellowship with you or one another. Work with us and within us. Do what you will with us. Make of us what you want of us. Change us as we need changed and use us as your will requires. We lift up to you our prayer concerns and our joys today and place them in your loving and gracious hands. And now in these moments of silence, Lord, we ask that you would receive each of the prayers that we offer to you. Amen. We offer all of our prayers to you, O God, and in the name of Jesus, our Lord, who taught us to pray with the prayer. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture readings today are from the prophet Isaiah and from Paul's letter to the Romans. Our first reading is Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him, each had six wings, and with two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me! I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. 
The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Our second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verses 12 through 17. So then, brothers and sisters, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if in fact we suffer with Him, so that we may also be glorified with Him. May God bless the reading and the hearing and the understanding of this God's holy word. Thanks be to God. Let us pray together. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. What do you call a reluctant potato? A hesitator. Well, Isaiah hesitated a little bit because he understood that he was a person in sin, a person who experienced the reality of sin in his life because he encountered the holiness of God, the wonder and the mystery of God, and he was overwhelmed. He was awed at what he saw and what he experienced. He realized that he himself was very human, very limited, and in fact, a sinful man. He describes uh, himself as uh, being a man of unclean lips in his encounter with God. And yet, we read where God took away his sin and God redeemed his life and God made it possible for him to answer the call that God was extending to him. James Merritt says, I read about a man who was on television on a television game show called The One Million Dollar Question. The host said to him, Bob, you haven't had a wrong answer all week. And the one million dollar question, uh, on the one million dollar question, you are one of the best players we've ever seen. And now you've chosen American history as the category of your final question. Are you ready? He said, I sure am. He said, okay, for the one million dollar prize, you have a two part question. And as you know, you can answer either part first. Which part would you like to take a stab at first? Bob said very nonchalantly, without hesitation, Oh, how about the second part? The host said, Okay, Bob, fair enough. I'm going to ask you the second part of your American history question first. For one million dollars, the question is, In what year did it happen? Well, Bob didn't hesitate, but maybe Bob should have hesitated a little bit. Isaiah hesitated, and Isaiah found God's grace. Isaiah uh, dated a great event in his life by a year, as we often do. He remembers the specific year because he begins by saying, in the year that King Uzziah died. Now, why was that year important? Well, uh, something happened uh, that year that allowed Isaiah to be able to, to get all of his uh, thoughts down and turn to a certain page and date, even to the hour and the minute, the point exactly where he was and what had happened, as we often do. What happened that year that was so incredible to Isaiah? A uh, little bit of background into the role of the prophets in ancient Israel uh, before we say more about that. Uh, God's chosen nation, through which he would send the world's Redeemer, Christ our Lord, had been brought to a pinnacle of, of glory by King David. King David's reign was an amazing time in the life of the people of Israel. When his son Solomon came to the throne, he consolidated all of David's gains and achievements and led Israel uh, to power and prominence and prosperity and prestige uh, that, that was known the world over. 
The Queen of Sheba, who had been told of the wealth of Solomon's court, could not believe it. She was not convinced. She came to see for herself, and her verdict was, the half has never yet been told. This is an amazing thing. The reign of David, the reign of Solomon. Even Jesus referred to Solomon's splendor and luxury when he told us to consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't toil, they don't spin. And yet, I say unto you that even Solomon in all of his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And after Solomon, however, there came strife and there came division, a civil war that would... Uh, uh, tear the nation apart. And, and the outcome was that Israel was split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom consisting of ten tribes uh, that was still called Israel, and the southern kingdom consisting of only two tribes known as Judah. And here the line of David was kept unbroken. The northern kingdom lasted for about 200 years, uh, and, and later it was overthrown. And, uh, but the little kingdom in the south, with its capital at Jerusalem, lasted for about another 100, 150 years. Finally, that small kingdom also was overcome, and uh, it, the people were taken captive in Babylon. And during this extended period of civil war and chaos and conflict and disintegration of their, their land and the captivity, God raised up a special group of people, a special group of people who would speak to the nation when they needed to hear from God, when they needed to hear some word of hope and healing and reconciliation. These were the people we call the prophets of Israel, and Isaiah was one of those prophets. Isaiah says in verse 1, I saw the Lord in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne. From, and, and, and he says again in verse 5, For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts, Isaiah had come face to face with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in this universe. Now Isaiah was grieving because the king had died. Isaiah was, a, uh, uh, was uh, devoted to, the, to King Uzziah. He believed King Uzziah to be a just and good king, and he was grieving his death. But he was assured that God, the eternal king, is still on his throne. Isaiah says, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Isaiah refers to God as the Lord. He, he, he recognized God's sovereignty, God's uh, sovereignty over all the earth and over all the universe. Even though the king that Isaiah had come to rely on was now dead, he knew that he could rely on the eternal king of heaven, God himself. Notice how immediately Isaiah reacts to this encounter. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am undone, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Isaiah was very aware of his own sin. He was very aware of the sin of his nation and of his people, and it created a sense of dread and anxiety in him. When Isaiah saw the Lord in his holiness, he saw himself in his sinfulness and the people in their wickedness. And when Isaiah saw God in his holiness, uh, he realized that uh, he was at God's mercy, and, and, and he needed God's grace if he was going to carry on. There, someone has noted that wherever you're sitting, there are three people sitting in your seat right now. There's the person you hope you are. There is the person other people think you are. And then there is the person that God knows that you are. And if we asked people on the street what they thought of Isaiah, they probably would have told you that he was a man of unquestioned integrity, moral righteousness, the epitome of, of, of goodness, but just one look at the holiness of God, and Isaiah realized that he was lacking. He was lacking, and he was a man of unclean lips, and he felt the guilt and the weight of all of that, and he realized that he was in the presence of the holiness of God. Immediately upon seeing the king, Isaiah cries out, I'm undone, I'm a man of unclean lips. The word undone in Hebrew could mean to unravel. He felt as if he were... He were just un unraveling and coming apart. Uh, there's a story told of a five-year-old boy that went to Florida for the first time with his family. He, was, he got sunburned out on the beach. A few
few days later, his skin started to peel off. He ran into the bedroom to his mother and said, Mommy, look at me. I'm five years old and I'm coming apart already. Well, Isaiah, when he saw the heavenly king, the Lord of Lords, that's what he said. I am coming apart. I am coming apart. Uh, many years ago, the Times of London um, ran a series of letters to the editor on the subject, What's Wrong with the World? And this stimulated a lot of interest and a lot of conversation uh, throughout the country. And many highly respected people wrote their views, which were printed and read by many, many people. But one day a letter appeared from the great Christian writer G.K. Chesterton, and here is what he wrote. To the editor, the Times of London, you ask what is wrong with the world. I am. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. Chesterton's letter ended the correspondence because everyone realized that he hit the nail on the head. We can blame this, we can blame that, we can blame those folks, we can blame those folks for what's wrong in the world. But Isaiah understood what we all need to come to understand, that we too, we too contribute to what's wrong in the world by our actions, by our words, by what we do and what we say. But when we stand in the awesome and holy presence of God, we begin to realize that there is hope. As much as we may feel like Isaiah, that we are coming unraveled in God's presence, as much as we may feel the weight of our guilt in, in the presence of God, we also are reminded that God makes a way for even his flawed, limited, imperfect people to move forward and to move ahead. Isaiah says, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal which he had taken with the tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. The seraphim takes that blazing white hot coal off of the altar, and he touches the lip, lips of the prophet, and he cleanses him. And Isaiah realizes that all is new and all is well and all is hopeful. God is holy, but God is also merciful. And it's an amazing thing to see time after time in the scripture that when people turn to God, when they confess their sins as we do every week, God offers forgiveness and mercy. God is holy and God is merciful. The seraphim were crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Seven out of every twelve references to the name of God in the Old Testament refer to God as holy. God's name is qualified by the adjective holy in the Old Testament more often than all of the other adjectives in the Old Testament put together. The, the chief attribute of God in the scripture is not necessarily power. The seraphim weren't crying out, Omnipotent, Omnipotent, Omnipotent is the Lord of hosts. They weren't crying out, Omniscient, Omniscient, Omniscient is the Lord of hosts. They weren't crying out, Omnipresent, Omnipresent, Omnipresent is the Lord of hosts. The chief attribute of God is holiness. And that's what they were crying out. That's what touched their lives. That's what changed the, the life of Isaiah. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Sometimes God's holiness brings dread and anxiety as it did for Isaiah. But the truth is God's holiness brings us hope. Some have made a distinction between the term holiness and sacred. We often use those terms interchangeably. But sacred could be anything that we designate as sacred. Uh, oftentimes we think of uh, the implements around the church or the, the, the physical space of the church as being sacred space, which it is. But we could name anything sacred if we wanted to. We could name our favorite politician sacred. We could name our favorite uh, musical star uh, sacred, our, fa our favorite actors and actresses. We could name them sacred. We could worship them. Just because we designate something sacred doesn't make it holy. O holy. Only God is holy and God shares his holiness, and through his holiness, God extends mercy and grace to those uh, of us who realize how much we need God's mercy and love. Only God is holy. Holiness is not something that God has, nor is it something that God does. It is something that God is. It is a unique holiness. There's none holy 
like the Lord, for there is none besides you, nor is there any rock like our God, we read in 1 Samuel. Notice exactly what happens in verse 8. Also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Isaiah says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Now that Isaiah has had this, this wondrous encounter with the mystery of God and the holiness of God, he hears a voice asking, uh, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? And Isaiah answered, This time without reluctance this time without any uncertainty. Here am I, send me. Isaiah is now so close to God, uh, he, could, he, he, he hears exactly what God is saying. Because the Lord uh, wasn't just talking to himself, he was talking to Isaiah. Who will go for us? And indeed, Isaiah answers the call. Whom shall I send and who will go for us? What an amazing question and what an amazing way Isaiah responds, Here am I, send me. Oftentimes we Christians uh, uh, may try to defer to someone else. Uh, when we hear God ask that question, uh, whom, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Our inclination may be to say, well, um, why don't you send him or why don't you send her or uh, why don't you let someone else do it? That's not what Isaiah did, and that's not what you and I are called to do today, sisters and brothers in Christ. You and I are called to respond as Isaiah responded. Here am I, send me, because God has taken away our iniquity. God has taken away our flaws. God has taken away all that limits us from doing the work and the will of God. Let us say with boldness, with Isaiah, here am I. Send me. May we, like Isaiah, respond to God and to God's call with the words, Here am I. Send me. What's next? What's next when we answer that call? Well, whatever it is, God will be with us, the holy God who redeems our lives and makes all things new. Amen. I invite you to join me in affirming our faith as we say together the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy universal Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Our next hymn is hymn number 452, Here I Am, Lord. Yeah. 
the Lord of snow and rain. I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them. They turn away. I will break their hearts of stone. Give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them. Whom shall I send? God is the giver of life. Christ is the gift sent to share our lives, and the Holy Spirit is the power that enables us to continue in generosity, justice, and joy. Let us open our hearts and our lives to God and to one another. Please join me for our prayer of dedication. It is only because of Jesus Christ that we are bold enough to call you Father and Mother, O Sovereign of the Universe. We do so now to remind ourselves of our many sisters and brothers, your many children who need hope and care. Use our gifts to reach others with the story of your great love for our world. Amen. 
Our final hymn in honor of Memorial Day is hymn number 705, Mine Eyes Have Seen the Glory. Thank you very much for worshiping with us today. We hope that the service was a blessing to you, and we hope that you have a wonderful week, and uh, it is filled with joy and peace and hope. Uh, I would like to share with you our benediction, which comes from Paul's letter to the Philippians. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Sisters and brothers, go in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Serve the Lord. Amen.